Good morning. This is our meeting today. I uh, will call to order uh, on June 10th, 2024. And this is not going to be a regular meeting because we do not have a quorum. However, it will be an informational meeting. Um, so, Tanya, please call the roll. Chair Cervantes. Present. Vice Chair Munoz. Commissioner Donnelly. Present. Commissioner G. Commissioner Holguin. Commissioner Liu. Here. We do not have a quorum. The materials presented are for informational purposes only. No action will be taken nor discussion on votable items. Are there any public comments today? Ms. LaRose has a public comment. Oh, that's what I was looking at this morning. Oh, uh, no, I do have uh, public comments, but they are related to the report that uh, uh, Chief Zelensky will be giving. And um, I don't know, we did not discuss how we would be co coordinating that, but I did discuss some of the concepts with him before the meeting started. So, Ms. LaRose, uh, after we present the report, uh, we'll open up public comment for you to comment on that item, if you'd like. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to item number two on the agenda. Uh, we go to crime statistics for April 2024. Uh, that was going to be a uh, uh, consent item only, so there was no presentation. It was more informational. That item is sent out to uh, the community. We do it on our website as well as our neighborhood watch meetings, and that was provided for the commission as uh, informational only. So there was there's no need to uh, obviously without a a, uh, a a quorum. There's no need to vote for that, but uh, there is also no presentation on that as well. Okay. Go ahead. So, what we go on to the next item, or you're gonna, you're not gonna make the presentation. No presentation on on the crime statistics. Okay. It's informational only. So, if uh, you are ready, we can jump to the next item. Okay. Let's let's do that. Okay. More. Uh, Brian Slensky, Police Chief, South Pasadena, and thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Detective Richard Lee. Uh, he's from the South Pasadena Police Department, and he also, as a uh, ancillary duty, is our crime analyst. So he has prepared a report based off of uh, a recommendation from council and public request to highlight South Pasadena's uh, uh, hate crime uh, policy and statistics. So, uh, Detective Lee, if you'd like to come up and begin. Afterwards, we're happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Okay. That's all. Good morning, Commission. Hello? Yes. Uh, my name is Richard Lee. I'm a detective. I'm also the crime analyst and crime prevention officer with our department. <clears throat> so today, uh, today I'm going to make a presentation about the hate crimes. All right, so the, do I have to speak this close or can I, okay, like this? Yeah, can you hear me okay? If I talk yeah, we're here fine here. Uh, so quick, I'll talk about the agenda while I'll talk about uh, introduction to hate crimes, uh, some trends, both regional and local, uh, specific concerns to South Pasadena, uh, potential future issues, some recommendations and then for our conclusions. Okay, so when we talk about hate crimes, it doesn't necessarily mean about anger or rage, like, you know, someone cutting off the freeway. I hate that guy. Or, you know, your kid saying, I hate eating veggies. I don't want my vegetables. I hate eating vegetables. 
Um, no, it's not like that. When we talk about hate crime, the hate basically means uh, a bias uh, against a person or persons that have specific characteristics. And we'll talk about the, uh, the characteristics in a couple slides. All right. So basically, hate crimes in, in general, you might say, this has been going on for a long time. Back in the 1950s and 60s with the big civil rights movements, um, that really started to come about, uh, bring awareness to the people. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1968 that uh, it made it a federal prosecution for about hate crimes. Uh, it was a bias against the victim's race, color, religion, or national origin. Uh, but because the federals did it, it had to be uh, why it was protected under federal protected activities, like uh, going to schools or voting, something like that. So in 1998, oh, you have Mr. Matthew Shepard. He was a member of the LGBTQ um, community. Uh, he was killed in Wyoming. The same year in 1998, Mr. James Bird Jr., uh, he was also murdered uh, in Texas. Uh, both incidents were not related to each other at all. They just happened to be the same year. Uh, so basically, it took almost 11 years afterwards that uh, they made another uh, expanded, you might say, on the hate crimes. They call it the Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr., the Hate Crime Prevention Act of 2009. Uh, like I said, it expanded on the hate crime laws to include motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. He also removed the uh, part that says federally protected activity because when they were both murdered, they couldn't charge him for a hate crime because, well, one, they didn't do anything that was... Uh, under federally protected activities. They weren't voting, they weren't going to school when the crime occurred, you might say. So they couldn't apply that. And specifically like in Texas at the time, Texas, the state itself, didn't have a specific hate crime law itself in that state. So this is now a federal one, so they just protect uh, everyone. So what is a hate crime defined as, as far as the characteristics? Um, is a crime against a person, a group, or property uh, that's motivated by a victim's real or perceived characteristics. And one or more of the following characteristics. Uh, you got disability, gender, nationality, race or ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or associations with person or groups possessing any of the above characteristics. So well, since 1998, after both Shepard and Bird uh, were murdered. Uh, most states pretty much now enacted their own specific hate crime statute uh, that pretty much provides for enhanced penalties uh, for crimes or for, for hate crimes. And it's important to note that when we talk about hate crimes, it's not just against a person. It also covers properties uh, such as arson and vandalisms, uh, specifically to houses of worships. Now, hate crimes do differ from other crimes since the perpetrator is motivated by bias, not for monetary gain, like robbery or something. I want to rob uh, you for your necklace. I'm doing that for monetary gain, you might say. But hate crimes are <laughs> hate crimes are not perpetrated by that. They have a different reason. It's for bias, basically focusing on one of the seven characteristics. Uh, of course, others may, be, may feel victimized who share the same characteristics as the victim. So if, say, my mother or, you know, a person of you know, Asian descent was a, vic was a victim of a hate crime, well, sure. Now, I may be kind of victimized as well because they were targeted for being Asian. Well, so am I. So that's what they're talking about, how it also, uh, not just one person, but affects others of the same characteristics like that. Now, the hate incident is a little bit different now. A uh, hate incident is an action or behavior motiva motivated by hate, but is legally protected by the First Amendment right to freedom of expression. That could be like uh, displaying offense material on one's property, posting of hate material that does not result in property damage, and distribution of materials with hate messages in public places. But basically, you're talking about you know disre disrespectful, 
behavior or, or words, uh, but they haven't crossed over into a criminal act. It's one thing to say, you know, I don't like Asians or something. Yeah, okay. But if he says that and he's going to assault me and he actually hits me while saying that, well, he committed the act of assault on me while saying, uh, you know, a hate, in, uh, hate speech. That will be now turned into a hate crime, not a hate incident. Uh, statistics, regional trends, the FBI, I'm sorry, it's kind of small or to read. Uh, but from 2001 to 2002, and this came from the FBI, uh, when they tracked about hate crimes, uh, they showed a 7% increase between 21 and 22. I'm sorry, I couldn't find an updated one for 23. I tried to look, but it wasn't out there. So their um, most current one I could find was 21 and 22. Uh, but out of the biggest groups, you see the incidents was by race, ethnicity, and there's a big jump down. You got the religion, sexual orientation, uh, so forth down the uh, gender. Now they do say that because this is an election year though, you know, we gotta be careful that it could spike up again because of that. Uh, locally though, uh, once a month, we meet with our San Gabriel Valley agencies. Uh, the main reason we do that is to share intelligence for like crime trends, you know, where we have a, a residential burglar that may be the same person with a person doing the same thing in Pomona or uh, Glendora, Alhambra. So we share this information around. Uh, but our last meeting in May, we talked about hate crimes and asked them about if they've seen any rise in hate crimes. And all of them said no. Thankfully, they said no. Now, concerns specific to South Pasadena. Uh, South Pasadena is a very diverse population. I mean, yes, we have big, you know, Caucasians, big Asians. We have Hispanics, African Americans, Pacific Islanders, all different type of races all come to South Pasadena. You know, I grew up here in South Pass. I went to Monterey Hill School, the junior high and the high school. You know, so I've definitely seen the population just grow and also help see how it diversified. You know, it's great to see the big diversification. You know, you just don't have one specific group coming to South Pasadena, say like Asians. We all, it's not like, it's not called Chinatown, right? No, it's South Pasadena. Why? Because you have all these different ethnicities coming into the city. And why do they come South Pass? Because we've got a great police department, right? That's the reason why they come to South Pasadena. Beside, <laughs> beside having a good school, yes, that's probably secondary, of course. Uh, in a small town atmosphere, yes. But if people come to South Pasadena because it's a great city. But, you know, South Pasadena isn't, uh, you know, sheltered from crimes in general. You know, we still have our, you know, assaults, robberies, a lot of uh, thefts. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our crimes are going to be property related. Thankfully, a lot of our violent crimes, uh, like robberies, are low. Uh, but we still do have our instance of violent, uh, excuse me, hate crimes. Uh, it is low, thankfully. Uh, pre statistics for the past several years, you know, we only had one or two. 2022, we had four. Uh, this year, we had one. Uh, but for the most part, it is very low, though. But even one incident can definitely uh, expand to get the community uh, worried, you might say. Again, we have, I think the latest census shows we have like a 30% Asian population. If one of those, we had a hate crime focus on Asians, well, that's 30% of the community now who are going to be kind of few victimized. And like, wow, what's going on? Uh, so how one incident can definitely expand the community. Uh, concerns specific to South Pasadena too is, uh, like all crimes, underreported. Uh, victims may not report hate crimes for fear of retaliation, lack of awareness about how to make a report, and mistrust of law enforcement. Uh, we see that, you know, maybe with a lot of the immigrants from other countries where they're kind of like, you know, afraid of the, going to the police. They come to the United States and, yes, we're different. We want them to report. We want to help them. Um, again, like all crimes, a lot of crimes, you know, if they say for every, like, shoplift, one, every one that gets reported is probably five that doesn't get reported at all. Uh, so 
we want people to report. We want to keep, um, not just for statistics purposes, but we want to make sure that we can help them, help the victims. Uh, youth involvement. Uh, a lot of the youth today, especially with social medias, I mean, no longer do they have to just go to tell their friends. You know, you talk about social media, not only do you tell people locally, but some of the social media people, man, they go out nationwide. You got all these uh, YouTubers, you might say, oh, the people like one million people, and all they do is just daily activity stuff. But yet, what they can um, reach out, the amount of people that can reach through, th through social media is incredible. And so we have to be careful about what uh, the youth now, what they talk about. Uh, community outreach. Uh, we definitely want to strengthen our partnership with our community organizations, our religious institutions, and advocacy groups to address issues that contribute to hate crimes. Uh, we have some great uh, organizations in the city, too, that we can reach out to. One of the biggest ones is the South Pasadena Chinese American Club. You have WISPA as well, a uh, bunch of different organizations. Uh, potential future issues, well, like I mentioned, this is an election year, so you're definitely going to have an increase of, you know, political campaigning, whether it's one side or the other. It's You watch the news. It's one side over the other. They're always bashing each other. So, yes, uh, you mentioned about social media, not just for youths, but even adults and organizations. They target, you know, a lot of, I don't say misinformation, but yes, a little, some of it could be misinformation or construed to more of their way of saying or what they're thinking. Uh, current events, of course, the war in the Middle East, uh, that's definitely big. And of course, recently we had all the, uh, the rallies on the college campuses. Uh, some recommendations, uh, enhanced training. Uh, we do off, like, offer specialized training, especially to law enforcement personnel, community leaders, uh, to provide them with knowledge and skills necessary to identify, respond, and of course, prevent hate crimes. Uh, all the South Pasadena Police Department employees have undergone uh, state-mandated training uh, through the Museum of Tolerance. Uh, not only that, we have a, a specific policy, which is number 319 in our policy manual that talks about hate crime. Uh, education initiatives. Uh, implement some uh, educational programs with students and community centers to promote diversity, tolerance, and conflict resolution. Again, the Museum of Tolerance, they offer programs not just to focus on law enforcement, but they also offer it to community leaders, community leaders and to schools. They have that program available. Uh, I believe it's free to tell the truth as well. Uh, community engagement. Uh, foster dialogue forums, public uh, forums with law enforcement, government officials, and community organizations, such as South Pasadena, the Chinese American Club, uh, WISPA, uh, others, to address these concerns. Uh, we do have hate crimes available in the lobby. And also we want to help with the, uh, not just the community, but the parents. They take a big role for their youths. Uh, parents need to really monitor children for their social media activities, definitely. Um, whether it's for hate crimes or just their normal activities, what they're involved in, it's very, very important for parents to get involved with their children, not just just do your homework, I'm gonna go do something else. Uh, they really have to monitor their social media activities. Uh, preparedness planning, preparedness planning, sorry. Ensure that both police and fire departments have comprehensive contingency plans to respond to uh, civil unrest or uh, election related uh, incidents. Uh, we do practice that and train on that. That's very important, if anything, is to keep training on that. It's one thing to just have a written policy, but if you don't really train on it, you wouldn't really know what to do. So it's very important that we train all together on that. And not just our agencies, but we also have our what we call mutual aid uh, with other agencies. I know we're a small department. Uh, we have other agencies who should we need additional resources. Alhambra, Pasadena, San Marino, 
So it's all important that we always train together. A uh, victim assistance. Uh, it's very important for victims that we facilitate some kind of collaboration between us and the LA County District Attorney's Victim Services Unit that provides services uh, to victims of hate crimes and of all crimes in general too. Uh, but specifically any kind of resources we can provide uh, the LA County District Attorney's Victim Services, they offer different counselings, uh, victim restitutions, case updates, uh, so they're a big help as well. And we've also used the community uh, groups too as well. Uh, I think in the past, if I remember correctly, there was an incident where an Asian Chinese guy was murdered in LA. He was an Uber driver. He was killed in downtown LA. Well, he lived in our city, uh, but the family was predominantly Chinese speaking. So we actually reached out to the Chinese American Club. They came out a really wealth of information and helpfulness, to tell you the truth. Uh, translators, they can uh, easy talk to them, get them also involved, help them out. Yes, we only have a few Chinese translators in our department, but with the help of the, uh, the South Pass the Chinese American Club, it made them feel more comfortable, you might say, as well. So it's good that we have that connection with our community organizations. Uh, so conclusions, uh, addressing hate crimes uh, does require a comprehensive multifacetated approach that involves proactive measures, media engagement between the police and the community. Uh, like all crimes, like Neighborhood Watch too. It's a two-prong attack, you might say. The police and the community have to work together. Uh, by working together, we can continue to uphold the values of, of diversity and respect for all South Pasadena residents. With that, my contact information here is so as well as the chiefs. And Ms. Rose, you had questions? Now, now would be the time for public comment if you'd like to. The mic is yours. There's so many things. I'll get up here. There's so many things on my mind with regard to this topic and uh we are trying I'm, my thoughts are jumbled uh and so they're not going to be coming out in in a linear fashion but uh we're coming we're struggling to emerge from the sundown town mentality it still exists and uh The instances when I'm confronted with it have begun to lessen as this year has been progressing and as I have spoken with regard to some of the reports that have been presented to the city and to this body. And I'm glad of that. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it still exists. The amount of acceptance that's emerging, especially with regard to those with disabilities and accommodations, is rising, and I'm glad of that. But because we're emerging from the sundown town mentality, it makes me wonder if, yes, as uh, Detective Lee has pointed out, the targets of crime, these hate crimes, are afraid to report them, but they're also confused as to whether it should be categorized as a hate crime. And so, and then we've got this mentality from the past that says, oh, that's not a hate crime because that's just the way we've always done things. Well, uh, we don't need a town that evolves into having the strange fruit hanging from trees because we already have been there 
not we in South Pasadena, but we as a nation have already been there and we don't need to go back. And so what I'm trying to say is we need to understand that our standards, as we say in our Pledge of Allegiance, with liberty and justice for all, equality for all, inclusiveness, not with regard to hate, but being involved needs to be for all. Because we all, excuse me, because we all belong here. We are a rainbow of opportunities because of the talents, sorry, I'm getting preaching and, and getting excited. Uh, because of the talents we have, thank God this is not a whole, an entire town of plumbers. We would never get windows fixed. <laughs> uh, and so we need to celebrate the fact that we have so much talent. It doesn't matter what color it is. We could be a town full of Kermits and Smurfs. <laughs> the bottom line is, what do we have to offer that makes us better? And how can we appreciate it and show our appreciation of it? Uh, we don't need to go back to the days of uh, slavery and, and before women's rights uh, came to the fore and women and, and those who were slaves were not allowed to have education or earn a living, do anything to earn a living. And so, Going back to uh, and and we know we don't need to be repressing people. We need to be lifting them up and opening doors for them to be more involved, equally involved, positively involved, and respecting one another for what comes to the fore. Uh, there, there are things that are discussed. So, one of the things I have a draft uh, email that asks is uh, to what extent do people know when when something is a hate crime? Is it going to be, if they report it, is it going to be dismissed as another instance of, oh, that's how, well, how always, how we've always done things. We don't like change. Or is it going to be taken seriously? Should we be having a public forum where we come to an understanding of what these terms are so that there's more education for the public to uh, think about what is impacting us and to the degree that it is impacting us? I like the fact that we have statistics that show that there was only one hate crime in a city of more than 25,000. It troubles me that there were four that were reported. And I'm wondering what the nature of those hate crimes were. You and I can discuss that later. <laughs> but it's troubling that those were reported. Those did happen. But how many others were there that were dismissed? I have neighbors who... now on a monthly basis, do something to violate my home and my property and me and deface it. And they smugly have announced, well, you need to paint your house. You need to repair this. You need to tear down some of your property. We, we tend to be neat and tidy. Excuse me. You don't need to be messing around with my house and defacing the property and then have an officer tell me that the instrument of the harm was not broken, was not damaged. So it does the, the fact that there was vandalism that happened to deface the property, to, to reduce the quality of the property and the, and the, uh, the, the value of the property. Miss LaRose, your time is up. Okay. Is not, is, it is, it was not a hate, was not a, 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 a case of vandalism. It was actually just some things that got thrown in the yard. Excuse me. There was damage. There was defacement. 
And so I did take the time to educate some of our officers on what some phrases mean with regard to really getting upset. I really do need to sit down. Uh, mean with regard to what is hate speech and what the racial connotations that go along with some things that are said to our citizens. Therefore, I wonder, do our officers know what racially motivated things are? Chief and I have talked about freedom of speech compared with acts, but when you have them culminating over a long period of time, So I think Ms. LaRose brings up a very valuable point, and that is the terminology and definitions that we use. And what I've seen in my experience here in South Pasadena is the difference between hate, a hate incident and a hate crime. A crime is a crime no matter what. It's just a matter, the difference with a hate crime is whether it's driven by a bias. So as to Ms. LaRose's point, uh, we do take all crimes serious and all crimes would be documented. Whether or not it's a hate crime, that remains to be seen based on the investigation and if there's some sort of bias. Remember, a bias is a protected class of anyone's sexual orientation, their age, their their uh, race, their national origin, those types of things. So if there is a pattern of violation there that leads to a crime, then, of course, it would be a hate crime. If it's simply uh, if it's speech or it's another uh, mechanism of expression and it's protected under the First Amendment, then it would be a hate incident. And I think uh, in my experience, we have a lot of uh, I don't even want to say a lot, but we've had some reports of hate incidents where I think people are confused just by the fact that it might be hate speech. They assume automatically that it's a crime, and that is simply not the case. It has to be an actual crime that is not protected under one of the uh, one of, one of our law, existing laws, uh, such as the First Amendment. So it'd have to be an actual crime uh, perpetrated based upon that that bias or hate. So that uh, that is always a challenge is getting that information out to the community. As we come up upon the election season, we're looking also at our geopolitical issues that are going on right now. The propensity for hate crime and hate speech has certainly risen. And we are anticipating as the election season starts to uh, unfold that we'll see more of that type of rhetoric. What we would ask our community is one, please don't participate in that type of behavior. But two is if it does occur, please call the police department, report it to us and let us know so we can track that. Oftentimes we see uh, many of the same perpetrators in different events. So we don't know that if it's not reported. But we're happy to answer any questions that the commission may have, if any. What I find disturbing in uh, this conversation is the fact that there is such a thin, thin line between an incident and a hate crime. And if the incidents keep, keep repeating themselves, I think automatically they should become hate crimes as opposed to remain incidents and what some people don't realize or understand is the kind of damage they do to a person when they assault them either verbally or to their property. This is something that you don't understand unless you have suffered. And I think it just shouldn't be allowed, period. Uh, definitely hate crime is a big topic among the Asian American, particular Chinese American. We have talked a lot. We have uh, kind of uh, had, had a lot of uh, discussions in the community. Uh, particularly in South Pasadena, I didn't see much happening in recent years. Uh, I, I believe in COVID area, I myself is a kind of a victim of the incident, not a crime. When I, I'm, I'm a runner. I ran across the street from Mission uh, all the way to Rose Bowl. Then one of the guy rolled down uh, in the car, rolled down the window and uh, shout at me, go back to your home. Yeah. Now I, I it's, for me it's okay, but similar things happen in the school. I know 
one of the kids in Orange County the, at school. Other kids just say, go back to your country. Other kids tell this uh, Chinese American kid, go back to their country. He, she was born here. It's it become a big deal. Then the, the school has to apologize. Yes, definitely we should be aware, particularly if, uh, the election season, something may happen, may make our uh, city look bad if a hate crime happens again. Thank you. So certainly speech like that is, is it's unfortunate and uh, we try our best as a city to, to curb that type of behavior, you know, whether it's our values, whether it's in a council meeting, it's in a commission meeting, we're out in the, in, in the community, uh, you know, any type of speech like that, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it breaks down the community. And as Mr. Cervantes said, it, it's an attack on individuals, whether it's hate or so civility is certainly one of those things that we promote, but we also see that uh, it's been diminishing over the years. Now, the question is really as a society is how do we, how do we wrap our arms around it? How do we, how do we bring that civility back into our, our community? Uh, I think education is probably the first start. And it's not just a law enforcement issue. It's really a community issue. It's, it's our schools. It's our religious institutions. It's our, our city government. It's police department. It's, it's everybody needs to wrap their hands around it and address it. When and and so frequently that leads to hate incidences, and of course more hate incidents leads to eventually hate crime. So it's it's a pattern of behaviors that that uh, is going up the ladder eventually that that leads to a hate crime, and those are the types of things we're trying to stop. But going back to the educational component is I make myself available and the police department as well. Uh, if there are any civic groups, be it WISPA, be it the Chinese American Club. Rotary, Kiwanis, we are always available to go out and talk to the different groups, uh, not just on hate crimes, but any other issues that are facing our community. We make ourselves available. We're looking for the opportunity so that we can foster not only the better relationships, but also we can spread message, our message and information so that the more informed our community is, the better, the better partnership we'll have and, and we'll be able to tackle these problems moving forward. So uh, if there is any, um, if, if you're aware of any of those civic groups that would like to uh, uh, host us, we're, we're happy to do so and reach out to me at any time. But if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, if not, that is the end of our presentation for, for this portion. And uh, leave it up to the commission if they have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're moving on to item number five, City Council Liaison Communications. Council Member Braun, do you have anything that you would like to share? Mm. Okay, you're welcome. Um, then we go to City Council Liaison Communications. Moving on to item number six, the Staff Liaison Communications. Chief Solinsky, do you have anything that you would like to share? Uh, just unfortunately, Chief Riddle couldn't make it today. He has a prior uh, commitment, uh, and then uh, his staff is also busy. They're they're hosting interviews, so uh, they couldn't make it today. From the police department uh, side, uh, we just want to mention that uh, we're moving forward with our uh, our recruiting efforts. Uh, they're paying huge dividends. We've got two officers in training, and they should be out in the field on their own within the next four to. Eh, three to four months. Uh, so that is a big help to the police department, uh, but that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to n item number seven, commission, commissioner communications. Commissioners, do you have anything that you would like to share? Uh, yes. Uh, I know uh, our police officers are understaffed so I try to outreach to the community and see, uh, seek interest and uh, let people know uh, we have opening for a different level of police officers and uh, let them know there are there are Asian Americans police officers as well. You will not be the first one. Uh, luckily, uh, during the event uh, uh, a few weeks ago for the Memorial Day event, I met with one uh, veteran from the army. So I present the idea, he's a young, young man, he's, uh, 
go went to school here. It's very interesting. Hopefully, it can work well. Thank you. Um, Chief Zelensky, uh, being respectful of an ongoing investigation, can you give us an update on the death on Brent uh, last week? So uh, last week, uh, as you may have heard, that we had an unfortunate incident where a, uh, a woman was murdered inside of her home. Uh, officers were out there about 8.45 as we received the call, 8.45 p.m. They responded and they found her unresponsive and suffering from multiple stab wounds uh, in her upper torso, which she ultimately uh, succumbed to those injuries. Uh, with the assistance of Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, uh, our department has partnered with them. We're investigating the, the incident. Uh, there was no signs of forced entry. The apartment was not ransacked. Uh, we do believe it was an isolated incident at this point, uh, but that's about as far as I can go with it. The investigation is still very fresh. It's ongoing. There is a lot of evidence to comb through and witness statements, but uh, as we progress and uh, we move closer towards a closure of this, I will keep the commission and the public informed. Thank you. Uh, Chief Kostolinski, I watched on the news uh, last week something very interesting, and that is that uh, a lot of police departments uh, around the nation are hiring uh, people who are coming out of the armed forces. And uh, you know, the armed forces training is very thorough. So they are actually, uh, what you call, almost prepare to integrate to a force. Of course, they need all the training that the police force needs. And I saw this was in LA, was not listed among those that were recruiting. Since we are so short of people still in South Pasadena, I was wondering if uh, an effort could be made to uh, take this into that direction, the recruiting uh, part, see if we can recruit directly people who are being, uh, uh, which call, have stopped their service with any of the armed forces uh, for, uh, branches. So that, that would be a recommendation. So our recruiting team does do that already. We go to the military career fairs on Camp Pendleton. That was the latest one that we went to. And so that's something that we've utilized in the past and still continue to do so. Oh, so you already do that? Yes. Okay, thank you. There is one more thing I wanted to share with you, and that is that I wanted to thank the chief for letting us have Detective Lee come over to the senior center and speak to my class. Uh, I have a class, a Spanish class for senior citizens, and we had about 20 people that come regularly, give or take sometimes, take out, go on vacation, so they're sick, but most of them show up. So Detective Lee did a fantastic presentation he said it was such a short notice, and it was. It was almost two days' notice to, uh, for the invitation. But he was there, and he had all the senior folks enthralled with his presentation. He was so thorough. The only thing I told him afterwards, after I thanked him, was you told them everything there is. However, you left them totally panicking. <laughs> about what's out there for them. But they were very thankful. They, even if they are senior citizens, they do like to be counted. And this time they felt that the police department care about them and, uh, and I was very happy for them. And I consider myself part of them. So thank you, Chief. You're welcome. And there's a follow-up to that. We're holding a, uh, a very similar class at the Senior Citizen Center, I want to say, in the next month. I'll give you a date for that, where Detective Lee is going to go into a little bit more detail, have some more time, and talk about scams that we're seeing in the community so that our seniors don't fall victim to that. Thank you. Um, moving on to, with no further items, 
or comments from staff, I will now adjourn the meeting at 9.25 a.m. Our regular next meeting will be August 12th, so we are dark on July. We don't have a meeting on July, and the meeting will be at 8.30 a.m. Thank you.